I love the lyric in that song. I lay down my old flames to take up your new fire today. I mean, you know, this is the way I talk. Like, that's pretty poetic. The way I talk is in order to start doing new stuff, you got to stop doing old stuff. Right? In order to start doing some new things, you got to stop doing some old things. Right? In order to start eating healthy, you got to stop eating Twankies. You know what I mean? In order to start exercising, you're going to have to stop sitting on your rear end on the couch. It's just, it's just a thing. And then we say this, I lay down my old flame to take up your new fire. For poetic people, I'm so glad you have that, right? For me, in order to start doing new stuff, you got to stop doing some old stuff. So here's what James wants to talk to us about today as we continue in this series. If you would like to make the transition to your speech being a blessing to others, you're going to have to stop the negative stuff. If you would like for your entire life to reflect the character and priorities of Jesus, and that's my assumption because that's what it means to be a Jesus follower. So if you call yourself a Jesus follower, that's what it is. It's a systematic reorganization of our life to reflect the character and priorities of Jesus, including but not limited to our speech James is going to talk to us about then we have to be a people who is willing to lay down old speech patterns and to take up new ones. I don't know about you, but I'm not always great in the way I speak to others. I'm not always great and careful with my words. Uh, Whether it's profanity or coarse joking, we'll get there here in a minute. Whether it's idle talk, you know, the Bible even warns against idle talk, words that come out of your mouth that just are just coming out of your mouth for no apparent reason. How many of you ever said something you regret? How many of you ever did one of those things where you say something about somebody and the person you're talking to goes, look right behind you, right? And you're going, oh, lovely, right? You know what, these days it's more often that you respond to a group text thread. You ever, somebody just went, oh. You respond to a group text thread that you thought was personal. Or why did they put, even email people who designed the user interface for email, okay? Don't put reply and reply all right next to each other. Because if you make a mistake, You're dead in the water. Anybody honest enough to raise their hand and say that? I have made that mistake before and hit, oh yeah, praise God. (laughs) Me too, me too. So listen, James is gonna begin to talk to us about our speech today and here's what I wanna do. I wanna point out a few principles, six or so, that James shares with us in his letter to the church, the broad church, that's you and me too, about our speech and the ways in which we can change our speech to reflect the character and priorities of Jesus. And then I want to give you a few really practical applications. You don't have to do all of them. I think there's seven or eight of them. You don't have to do all of them, but pick one of them. And and so we can take a step forward in making our speech honoring to God today. Here's what James says about our speech in James chapter 1. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. Let everyone be quick to hear and slow to speak. This is a very, very nice way of saying, very Canadian way. James would have been a very great Canadian Very Canadian way of saying, you talk too much. That's what he's saying. Quick to listen. You have two ears, one mouth. You should listen twice as much as you speak. You probably heard that before. You should be quick to listen and slow to speak. I did a little bit of research this week. Do you know that the average person spends more than 16 years of their life talking? That's the average person. Can you imagine what it is for me? It's like, I'm going to die at 82, and I'm going to spend 98 of those years talking. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm committed to doing it, right? The average female says 20,000 words a day. It's real. The average male says (laughs) 7,000. This is real statistics, men and women. I didn't make this up. It's not a joke. It's right there on the internet for you to find. You know why we only say 7,000 words a day? It's because y'all are doing this the whole time. We can't get a word in edgewise. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, don't turn on me now. 
right? In our house, this is interesting because this is flipped. I'm the talker in our house. Amy is not. She asks me a question and I say something like, well, there's a confluence of factors involved. There's a lot of things that we could consider here. Very sophisticated question you've asked. Option A would lead us to consequence one, two, three. Perhaps we would choose option B, but there might be some unintended positive consequences there we may never know about. Option C sounds okay, but here are the pros and cons of option C and there are options D, E, F, all the way down to Z. We might even know about all those things. And so really, this is a complicated question. Ask Amy the same question. She'll go, I don't know, why don't we just order pizza? (laughs) James wants to know, you talk too much. You talk too much. Again, the Bible doesn't just warn it. We talk about the speech. When we consider that, think about that. It's like, okay, so I don't want to swear, especially not using that one magic word that starts with F. I don't want to do that. And I don't want to talk about, you know, sexual stuff and mixed company and whatever else. The Bible goes farther than that. Jesus goes farther than that. He says, man, that's a pretty low standard you're talking about. What I'm talking about here is, is just idle words that are coming out of your mouth. Just stuff that's just there and it's just, just silent. So you just fill the gap because it's silent. You ever sit down at a restaurant, you eat what's on your plate, and then, and then even after you're done, you're no longer hungry, you just keep eating those fries? You ever been there before? You're like, I am not hungry, but I cannot stop eating these fries just because they are there. That's right. Same as silence, right? It's like we're uncomfortable with silence and I just got to fill it up just because it's there and you just start talking about stuff. Man, oh man, the Bible says just cool your jets a little bit. You don't have to fill it up all the time. You talk too much. You excited you came today? That's principle number one. Here's principle number two, James chapter three, verse one. So we pick up, pick up where we left off last week. So if you're tracking in your Bibles, I hope that you're reading along with me here. James says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. This is not a happy verse for pastors. Some of you might be thinking, oh, this is a warning for pastors, and it is, and that's true, and I'll just be honest with you, I think about this verse almost every day. The the weight of this sits pretty heavy on me. But listen to what James is saying. He's addressing my brothers, right? He's not addressing, not many of you should become teachers, because teachers, you are judged with greater strictness. Although that's true, although that's true, he's addressing my brothers. He's addressing, as we say in Texas, y'all, right? He's, he's addressing all of us. And some of you are going, well, I don't, it's not really me because I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to stand up there like Lucas does and do a 40 minute monologue and the whole thing. Like, I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in that. So it's not necessarily talking to me. However, I can almost guarantee you that you have opinions, some of which you have shared with us, some of which you have shared with your friends or with your spouse or whatever about the way we organize around here. And in that way, you step into a leadership position. You step into a pastoral position that is not yours to step into. I'm just going to be straight honest with you here. I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you. But when you sit down and email Dave Lewis and go, you know what, this life group thing, I don't really like this. We should do something different. You are stepping into a role of teacher that is not yours to step into. You will be judged with greater strictness. When you send an email to Andy Cherry and go, you know what, I don't think I like, we should do more hymns. You should wear a sport coat more often. This is this how people type? I don't know. This is my gesture for typing. I should stop doing that, right? You are, you are stepping into a teacher role, and James would admonish you. He says, don't step into that role because you're probably not a professional. I mean, listen, men and women of God, those, who, those of us who are pastors here who are charged with shepherding this congregation, we do things that we believe are best for you. We believe we are called by God to do. We are doing our very best. And let me be honest with you, we eat, live, sleep, and breathe this stuff. Our spouses, pastors here, because I, I know this guy hanging with you, our spouses have to call us out of ministry-minded stuff and go, hey, could you be present with us? <laughs> Because you focus on it, and all the time we're thinking about the latest thing we read, the latest thing we think about, what we're studying in the Bible, this innovative new thing we want to try in ministry, and then we get this email out of of nowhere, you've been at work all day and all that stuff. I'm not saying there's no room for criticism. I'm not saying there's no room for feedback. I would just say the same thing that James just said to you. Not many of you should aspire to that, brothers. Just be careful in the ways in which you step into a teaching position that is likely not yours to step into. Let's keep going. For many of us stumble in many ways. All of us stumble in many ways. Are we okay with this? We all know what this means. 
You're not perfect, I'm not perfect. We good with that? I don't have to explain that? Good. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to, watch this, bridle his whole body. Wow, fascinating thing that James is saying here. He's saying, if you can control your speech, then you can control everything else. This is the most complicated part. This is the most difficult part. This is the most challenging part, your speech. He just talked about, you know, adultery. He just talked about hating your brother. He just talked about a couple other things, talked about hospitality. He goes, you know what? Compared to controlling your speech, that's pretty low-hanging fruit. The speech, controlling your speech, is the hardest part. Now, he wants to illustrate this, for, illustrate this principle for us, that if you can control your speech, then you can control all of who you are. He wants to illustrate it for us, and he's going to illustrate it this way. He says, we put bits into the mouth of horses so that they obey us, and we guide their whole bodies as well. Everybody gets this, right? Little bits, little silver metal thing you put into a horse's mouth, attach it to reins, put a rider on the back, and that rider can take that horse wherever he or she wants the horse to go with it. Okay, next illustration. He says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Very, very small rudder comparatively is guiding this enormous ship. And not just an enormous ship, but an enormous ship that's being driven by strong winds. You see, that smallest thing makes all the difference. Now, you may experience this in other areas of your life. The smallest thing makes all the difference. The smallest thing can help you succeed. The smallest thing can destroy you if the smallest thing is used appropriately. Let me, let me convince you in case, in case you don't know this. In the summertime in Toronto, have you ever been out somewhere where there's mosquitoes, Right? And you get in your car and you close the door and unbeknownst to you, one of those little critters creeped in there had a mosquito in your car or a bee in your car, God forbid, you're going down the 404 at 120 kilometers an hour. Of course, you would not break the law, but, you know, 120 kilometers an hour, and all of a sudden, there is a teeny tiny mosquito in your car, and what do you do? I'll let go of the wheel. I'm taking feet off the everything, and I'm slapping at this mosquito, trying to get it out of my car, trying to, and Kaya, Kaya's in the back, they're the same thing, Daddy, mosquito! And I am willing to put the, my life and the lives of my children in jeopardy. I don't care. In order to kill that mosquito. See, James is saying the same thing. It's the smallest thing. Smallest thing can cause really good things in terms of a bit in the mouth of a horse or in terms of a rudder in the case of a ship. But the smallest thing can cause destruction too. Here's another illustration James says. He says, so also the tongue is a small member. It boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. We get that too. Teeny tiny little match. Drop it in the right forest. All of a sudden, whoo. Hundreds and thousands of acres destroyed by this little bitty thing. He says the tongue is the exact same way. Like a bit controls a horse, the rider controls the bit. Like a rudder controls a ship, the pilot controls the rudder and thus controls the ship. In the same way, like a match can start a fire, start an enormous forest fire, that's the destruction your tongue can do. See, if you control the tongue, just like a rider controls the bit, go back one, rider controls the bit, you can control the horse. Just like a pilot controls the rudder, you can control the ship. If you don't control it, it's going to set a forest on fire, and that's not a good thing. James is saying to us, your tongue, next slide, controls the whole, and you control your tongue. And when you control your tongue, what it will do is it will breed control in the rest of your life. Do you want to be more and more like Jesus? Start with that little thing called your tongue. Start with your speech. This is a, this is a wacky thing to say. Just, just for a couple weeks, just focus on your speech and that's it. And it will cause other things in your life to come underneath the authority of Jesus just because you began to control your speech in the exact same way that a teeny tiny little rudder goes whoop and the whole ship goes whoop. Just in the same way that a teeny tiny little 50 pound grade three girl could take a rein and go like this eep, and a two ton horse goes Pow, this way. The same way your tongue controls your whole body. I was thinking about how to illustrate this, help you understand, but I was thinking about my own physical fitness, which kind of in and out of physical fitness all, all my life, really. But one of the things, one of the things for me that makes so much of it, the very smallest thing that makes all the difference is my diet. It's all about the way I eat. 
Like, and if I eat right, I want to exercise, I want to sleep well. If I eat right, it breeds discipline in other areas of my life. I, 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 I get up early, start my day earlier in the morning. I have never in my life eaten a box of Timbits. I wish that was true, but I've never eaten a box of Timbits and thought to myself, I'd like to go to yoga now. That doesn't happen. Two thoughts cross my mind after I eat an entire box of Timbits. One, I'm ashamed. That's number one, okay? Number two is I want a nap, right? Like the discipline in my diet breeds discipline in other areas of my life. James is saying the same thing. The discipline in your speech is going to breed discipline in other areas of your life. In other words, your speech is like a thermostat. It's like a thermostat, that teeny tiny little thing on your house. You push that thing up this much, beep, and your whole house changes temperature. And maybe it could cause you to not sleep. I mean, it has effects on so many other things. Just that little whip. Same thing, you push it down just a little bit. And all of a sudden, my wife's like, where's the blankets? You know what I mean? I'm like, it's, it's 28 in here. You don't need a blanket. She's like, I'm, yesterday, yesterday, we're driving. This has nothing to do with my sermon. Yesterday, we're driving. We're driving. It is 24 degrees. Silence in the car. Kids are in the back. We're just hanging. Silence in the car. Amy, literally, this word's come out of her mouth. Man, this seat heater feels good. It's 28. Turn off the seat heater. Where was I? <laughs> your speech is like a thermostat, right? It controls your whole house. Control your speech, and in turn, it will put the rest of your who you are under control. Keep going. The tongue, James says, is a fire. It's a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Well, that's not encouraging, is it? Okay, interestingly enough, James is doing a little play on words here. He uses this word world in the original Greek, quite literally, microcosmos, microcosm, right? In the Greek mindset, the body was a microcosm of the universe. That's where we get our word microcosm. He says, all the complex things that are going on in your body, the universe is just as complex. All the movement, all the mystery, all the unknown. In the same way, your body is that's like a little universe. And in that little universe, is your tongue set among all those things and it controls the entire universe of who you are in the course of your life, past, present, and future. He keeps going, says, for every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. <laughs> okay, James, tell us what you really think, you know? This is funny to me because he says every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed. Think of all the things that human beings have been able to tame over the course of human history. We've been able to harness solar power. We've been able to harness the power of the wind. We've been able to redirect rivers and put dams up and so huge lakes fill up. We've been able to tame wild beasts like lions. Mike Tyson had two white tigers. I was watching a video of somebody yesterday on YouTube that had a pet king cobra. He had tamed the king cobra, holding it with his hands. Spoiler, spoiler alert. The last five seconds of that YouTube video, that cobra goes untamed, and it's real funny. Um, so, turns around, bites the dude in the neck. It's awesome. He lived, he lived, relax. But Google it. People who have a weird sense of humor like me, Google it, right? We can tame all kinds of stuff. And James says, nobody can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil. That means it's an evil that just can't stop doing it. It's just always going. It's just always blabbering. It's just always messing stuff up. We can't harness it in. And it's full of deadly poison. That word is also venom. Still talking about snakes now. It's a venom that if it gets into somebody, it will wreck them, kill them, mess them up. James wants us to know today that your speech matters. You might not think that, you might not believe that, but I'm here to tell you that it's truer than anything you've ever heard in your life, that your speech makes a difference. The way you bless people makes a difference. When you curse people, it makes a difference. Not curse at like swear, but when you speak ill against them, it makes a difference. They hold those things in their heart and it shapes who they are, whether it's blessing or curses. Your speech matters. 45,000 people take their own life every year. More than half of them would say, I did it because I was bullied. You don't think your speech matters? 
I can think back on my own life and the times where my dad said he was proud of me. Were the times that my mother should not have withheld and held her tongue on me, and she did anyway. And how her speech or her, or her lack of speech or her, my dad's speech shaped who I am to the very core. I remember preaching a sermon eight, nine years ago at my former church. I'm a grown man, like, you know, paying my own bills, married, whatever. And after the sermon, I see this man coming down the aisle to come speak to me, and I recognize who he is because he's one of my heroes theologically. I hadn't really ever met him at that point, but I knew he occasionally attended that church. He had been an elder at the church in the past. I knew he was there on occasion, but he travels and speaks a lot. He's written a lot of books. Some of you who are theological nerds, I'm going to mention his name. The another 95% of you, I don't know who that is, but for the other 5%, his name's Wayne Grudem. He wrote a book called Systematic Theology and Politics According to the Bible. He's working on a book called about ethics right now. Brilliant, brilliant man. Went to Harvard, went to Oxford. You might have heard of those places. Very smart guy, right? Extraordinarily intelligent. One of the foremost respected theologians in the world today. And he's walking down the aisle to talk to me. And I'm going, right? Just, oh, oh. And he's a little bitty man. He's like a hobbit. He's a little bitty man. Like he's, he's very small. He's like, he's like a tiny little man. So he comes down the aisle and he comes and says to me, and, and he's so, Dr. Grudem is so careful with his words. You ask him, like, Dr. Grudem, where do you want to go to lunch? And he'll go like this. I believe the Spirit of God wants us to go to Swiss Chalet. <laughs> First of all, no, you know, the Spirit does not want us there. But then, uh, he's just very careful with his words, careful with his words, right? So he comes down the aisle and he says to me, Lucas, Three weeks ago at another church, I preached on that very same passage. And I thought, oh, this is awful. And he said, your sermon was so much better than what I did three weeks ago. It's funny because his wife was with him. <laughs> and she looks at me. It really was, Lucas. It's a lot better. <laughs> Dr. Grudem's going, I didn't, what? Like, throw me under the bus. Look. At that point, I was into my pastoral career. Pastoral career, you know what I mean by that. I was full-time, leading worship, all that stuff. And I remember that moment like it was yesterday. It was a 20-second interaction, and it means the world to me. You know you have that same impact on people in your life. Men and women of God, your kids need you to bless them with your words. They need you to not criticize them, to get on their case, to tell them they stink at violin or whatever it is. You need to get better or whatever. They need you to bless them with your words. Uh, men and women of God, your spouse needs blessing from you. It matters to them. It matters to them. It shapes them. <laughs> Excuse me. Good gracious. <laughs> <clears throat> That's never happened to me before. That was awesome. It's awesome. It's been great working here. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get over that. Can we just, can we, let's do this. You get, your speech matters. You with me? Yeah. That's where we were. That's what we were saying. We're just going to move on and act like that didn't happen. Keep going. James writes this. He says, with it, that means our tongue, our speech, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought, ought not be so. He's going to give more illustrations. Ready? He says, does a spring pour forth from the same uh, opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. James is using illustration. He's saying, look. You don't get a spring that gives you both fresh and salt water. You don't get a fig tree that gives you olives. If you have a fig tree, what's it going to give you? It's not a complicated question. If you have a fig tree, what's it going to give you? So you get embarrassed to answer questions out loud. I just hiccuped in front of everybody, right? It's not going to be nearly as embarrassing for you this morning as it's going to be for me. A fig tree gives you figs. That's right. It doesn't give you olives. A grapevine gives you Grapes, not figs, neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So James goes on to say, watch what he says. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but he deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Watch what he's saying. He's saying that your speech is also a thermometer. 
Not only is your speech a thermostat that changes your spiritual temperature, when you control your speech, it changes your spiritual temperature, either toward God or away from him, of your whole person. Your speech is also a thermometer. It will tell you your spiritual temperature. So if you got grapes coming out of here, what's inside of here? A grapevine. If you got figs coming out of here, what's inside of here? Fig tree. If you got salt water coming out, of, coming out of here, what's inside of here? A salt spring. You don't get both. So when you criticize others in your life, what's going on in here? You have a critical spirit. When, when, when you're a one-upper, you ever been around one-uppers in your life? Okay, if you've never been around one of them, talk to me. I'm a one-upper. I'm working on it, but I'm a one-upper. I get into conversations with people about just about anything, and they're like, oh, man, I went to the Jays game last night. I'm like, cool, where'd you sit? Oh, can you see the game from there? Yeah, like, I like to sit a little further down myself, you know. Yeah, I, 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 there's, there's this one-up thing that's happening to me. You know why? It's because when my identity in Jesus is kind of on shifting sands a little bit, I've got to one-up somebody else so that I make myself feel okay about me. That's just straight. It's the same thing with you. Women, women of God, and this is not just women, women with the passive-aggressive garbage. Like, men, by and large, we can be passive-aggressive, but by and large, being passive-aggressive takes some level of intelligence, which most men don't have. So we're just aggressive-aggressive, right? We're just like, I'm gonna hit you. You know, like, that's not that, right? The women do that thing. How do you like my new outfit? Cute. You ever had that conversation before? And you know what you mean by that? Yuck, right? <laughs> and you think, you think that, that nobody sees that. Your friend sees that. They feel that. They take that home and they treasure it up in their heart like Mary did. And it shapes them. And it's a negative thing that shapes them, not a positive thing. That garbage you do on Instagram, which is out there for all the world to see, and the comments you make about people, start watching your speech and saying, it's measuring my spiritual temperature. What is coming out of my mouth? Is it blessing or is it curses? Is it positive or is it negative? Because that will show me what's happening in here. You want to do something real crazy? Ask your spouse or your best friends how they feel when you speak to them. Go, go one step further. Ask your spouse, how do you feel when we're fighting, which Amy and I do not do, but you might. When we're fighting, how do you feel about the way I speak to you? Well, I feel criticized. I feel talked down to. I feel yelled at. Okay, you know what, friend? That's not about you trying to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. It's about you learning about something that's going on in here, learning about your heart and submitting that to the Lordship of Christ. God gives us these things all the time. He gives us these external indicators that help us measure our spiritual temperature. Check it. If anyone wants to know what's going on in his heart, what is your treasure? Check your spending. You heard that verse before? Where your treasure is, there your Heart will be also. See, you check your spending, it tells you what's going on in your heart. Same way, check your speech, it tells you what's going on in your heart. It's a real gift to us that our speech can be a spiritual thermometer. All right, practical applications. You're a practical person. What do I do? All right, got it. I got it. James is telling me I talk too much. It's a thermostat. It's a thermometer. Here are the principles. My speech matters. I got it. What are the things that I can do? Some of you are going to laugh at this one. Check it out. Take a vow of silence. So those of you who just giggled, you just messed it up, right? You just, you just made noise, so now your vow of silence is over. And I'm not saying 30 days, right? I'm not saying for the rest of your life. I'm not saying that. Some, some of you are with your spouse going, that'd be great. That'd be great, actually, if you would do the rest of your life. Um, do, do an afternoon. Do an afternoon. Or at night, put your kids down to bed. Once they're in bed, everybody's asleep, you know, dinner, whatever it is. Just say, okay, from 8 o'clock on, we're just going to be quiet, me and my spouse. We're going to read, we're going to whatever, and then we're going to say goodnight. And then the first time we speak again is going to be tomorrow morning. Just take a vow of silence. Here's the great thing about this. If you're quiet, you're not going to sin in your speech. <laughs> Win. Win. Take a vow of silence. Number two, increase the time between your thought and your speech. Think about this, okay? Think about this. Here's your timeline, left to right here. Past. 
present, future, right? Here's what happens. You have a thought somewhere on this timeline, right? Somewhere during the day, you have a thought, and then you articulate that thought in the form of speech, right? Okay, and there's a time gap between those things. I may be the only person on the planet that starts speaking before I have a thought. I mean, I don't know how I do it, but I do it, right? I told somebody in the office here that uh, my sermons are basically me verbally processing for 40 minutes and then concluding for two minutes. Like, that's essentially my sermons. And I'm trying to say, okay, I have the thought. It does not mean I need to speak it right away. I want to increase the time between that thought and speech. Just increase that time. Increase that time. Once you say it, you can't unsay it. So let's just increase the time to make sure that it's shaped right, crafted right. It's going to be a blessing for somebody. Increase the time. Number three, fast from criticism. Fast from criticism. Just say, I'm going to take a break from criticizing other people. Even if it's constructive criticism. Even if it's constructive. I'm going to take two weeks, and all I'm going to do is be a blessing to others. You are great at that, right? It's like, I'm not going to tell that person they have bad breath. I'm going to go, oh my gosh, it smells just like onions. Isn't that wonderful? You see, you fast from criticism, and then you say something positive. Don't do that. <laughs> I told Kaya that. She always pulls that on me. A couple weeks ago, I was putting her to bed. I said, baby, you are the most precious thing in the world to me. She said, thank you, daddy, but your breath smells so bad. <laughs> Close your eyes and go to sleep, stupid. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Didn't say that. Fast from criticism. Just take a break. Just take a break. See how it feels. Take two weeks. See how it feels. Here we go. Eliminate boasting. Eliminate boasting. I'm not going to talk about myself. I'm not going to talk about my accomplishments. I get it. There's a place in the world for resumes. There's a place in the world for sharing your experience with somebody else so it might build them up. But for some of us in the room, this is how we sin is by talking about ourselves, building ourselves up rather than building others up, rather than exalting Jesus. Too busy exalting ourselves to exalt anyone else or exalt him. So eliminate boasting from your life. Here's another one. Eliminate profanity. Eliminate profanity. And you might look at yourself and think, you know what, I don't, I don't, swear all that much. I don't use, you know, especially the real special words. You know, I don't, I don't swear all that much. But listen, I want to tell you a story about my wife. And, and here's, here's what you can aspire to. When you talk about eliminating profanity from your life, here's a person who is, I mean, and I'm telling you, I, I, it's a very rare occasion. And mostly it's because I've goaded her into it, right? It's a very rare occasion when she swears. She's like, I just don't see any place for it. She's like, you, see, you sound stupid when you swear. You know that, right? Like nobody hears you swear, nobody hears you curse and thinks, I think they've done a postgraduate education. Like nobody thinks that, right? It's, there, there's, there's just not even a place for it. The other night, this Tuesday night, we went to bed. I was restless, and so I got up and came downstairs probably about midnight. I was working for a little bit on the Judges series, which is coming right around the corner. I'm so excited about it. Working on that at about 2 o'clock, I finally laid my head down went to sleep. At about 2.30, Kaya calls out. So I came back upstairs and back down the hall, and on my right side is Kaya's room that I'm going into, and just in front of me is the master bedroom. Well, unfortunately, two things happened. Amy also heard Kaya call out, so she got up to go check on Kaya. The second thing was she was unaware that I had gone downstairs at any point. She thought I was still in the bed with her. So she thought a shadowy figure had come to take her children in the middle of the night. She was under that distinct impression. And I knew it immediately because I heard my wife's voice from our darkened bedroom go like this. Hello? Hello? <laughs> this is not an exaggeration. Fast forward 15 minutes. The reason she did that was twofold. One, she's like, I wanted to make my voice as scary as it could be. I'm like, well, sister, you were successful because I was picking terrified. It's me, it's me, it's me, you know. The second thing she wanted to do is rouse her husband, who she thinks is in bed with her, to get up, take off your CPAP machine, you know, and do something about it. I'm like, who's in the house, you know. I'm going, it's me, it's me. And I go in and I get Kaya calmed down and all this stuff. She goes back to bed. Kanan woke up a little bit. He went back to bed. It was great. 15 minutes later, we're, we're laying in bed. And I thought to ask her, I thought, what was going to be your next move? <laughs> like the first thing was, hello? <laughs> what was going to be your next move? And she, this is literally what she said. I was going to yell, 
no one takes my kiddos and then kick you. <laughs> Which would have been a great story. I wish you would have done it, right? But the other thing is Amy, Amy sleeps with a night guard. You know what a night guard is? So it would have been, no one takes my kiddos <laughs> while I'm ripping my CPAP off. You know, it's like this burglar's going, this, is, this house is a mess. <laughs> a mess. What, you people, what is wrong with you people, right? So let me, let me, I said, let me, let me clear something up, babe. I said, let me clear something up. It's possible that it's a burglar, robber, kidnapper, alien, demon, shadowy figure, you have no idea, has come into your house, not to take your TV, but to take your children. And not even as much as a darn it escapes your mouth. No one takes my kiddos, gosh darn it. She's like, I just don't think profanity has a place. It doesn't do anything. You think, I don't swear all that much. You get to that point, you come talk to me. And I, let me tell you something. She didn't need profanity to be terrifying, I assure you. I had to change my shorts after that. I was like, man, I'm scared. You don't need profanity to express your emotion. Just bridle your tongue and it will control your body. Here we go. Eliminate gossip and we'll end with this one. Eliminate gossip. Eliminate gossip. As you talk to other people, as you talk about especially other people's experience, ask yourself three questions. One, is it helpful? Is this going to be constructive? Number two, is it necessary? Do I need to say this? And number three, is this mine? Is it my information to share because it may not be? This is gossip. If the answer to any one of those questions is no, it's not helpful, no, it's not necessary, or no, it's not mine to share, that is gossip and you need to stop it because we are desired to reflect the character and priorities of Jesus in all all of life. Here's the last thing I want to tell you. Your speech matters more than you know. You have far more power than you know. You think you don't impact other people in the way you talk and the idle words coming out of your mouth. You say make some kind of flippant comment. You think, you think that when you bless somebody, they don't hold it in their heart for all that long. And when you compliment somebody, when you say cute top, or when you say to somebody, great job on that sale, or when you say to somebody, I see Jesus in the way you act, or when you say to somebody, hey, thanks for serving, when you say to somebody, your kids are really well behaved, or when you say to somebody, you're good at art, or when you say to some, whatever it is, they hold it shame them. It shapes them. It's like a match. It's a forest on fire. It's like a bridle in the mouth of a horse. It's like a rudder in a ship. It steers them and directs them. And I don't care if you wanted that power today or you did not want that power today. The Bible doesn't care. The Bible just says you have it. Whether you wanted it or not, you have it. So use it to be a blessing to God and others. Let's pray together. Father, in this next moment as we sing and respond, I pray, God, that this would be true of who we are, that your praise would ever be on our lips, that we would be a people whose speech is governed by your goodness and your glory, that we see each and every individual that we come into contact with, just as James said, as someone who's made in the image of God, so we see that image and we speak it to them and we speak blessing over others that we come into contact with. We pray these things in your name, Jesus, the people of God, together said, amen.